It's the Vermont Dog Trainers Show. Nobody's ever interviewed a dog. My wife is at the kitchen sink. I don't just walk up and shoulder her out of the way. I'm still a federal agent, Ian. Putting your arm up to your elbow <laughs> inside of a cow didn't appeal to me. You were shot three times. There are just some dogs that are sociopaths. Yeah, I've listened to every episode. Holding that squirt bottle like a 357. That's a really good question. I think that's probably one of the more accurate statements I've heard in a while, Ian. Shut up and train the dogs, man. Vermont dog trainer Ian Grant picks the brains of dog trainers across America. Listen as he tackles owner concerns on talking dogs. Join him for Chit Chat, a behind-the-scenes look at running Vermont Dog Trainer. The Vermont Dog Trainer Show is your common-sense, down-to-earth advisor on all things dog training. Now, here's your host, Ian Grant. Welcome to the show today, everybody. I have Ashley Roberts. She is from One of a Kind Canine in Rollins, Wyoming, and her website is oneofakindcanine.com. So, Ashley, uh, reaching out to Wyoming today, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So, uh, as always, I like to kind of figure out what everybody's start was and how you got into the dog business and the dog world. So, what was that uh, transition like for you? Well, I'm sure like everybody, it started way back when I was little. We got a Yorkie when I was about five, and um, I joined... 4-H with him, and we took the county fair by storm. He won best of show for multiple years in a row, and we ended up with so much bags of dog food. It was ridiculous. Pretty sure it lasted 10 years. <laughs> Little dog. <laughs> and then about, oh, when I was about fourth grade, I watched agility competitions on TV and decided that's what I wanted to do. And Bo was a little bit older then, and um, you know, of course, all the dogs on TV are border collies, and they film all the fast ones, so I was like, I need a big dog. So after months of talking to my parents and convincing them that I had to have a dog for agility. We finally uh, found a little a litter of free puppies here in town. They were lab border collie and blue healer mix. And I got one of those little black bear cubs and uh, she really kind of helped kick me a little bit further into the dog world. I'd like to say she's the best worst dog I ever had. She was very dog reactive, didn't care much for people. Um, just, just more of a, a difficult dog than what I was expecting in fifth grade, but really she helped kind of, kind of shaped me and helped me kind of fall in love with the, the dog training world. And uh, shortly, oh, about few years, four years after that, we ended up with my first Border Collie, Charlie, and just kind of did more agility with him, more 4-H stuff. In college, I, we bred Charlie, and I kept one of his pups and um, got some other dogs throughout college. And I went to college for pre-vet and got my bachelor's degree for that. But our my uh, advisor told me you should best to have plans B through Z lined up because it's really hard to get into vet school. Hmm. So in my research for my backup plans, I found National Canine School for Dog Trainers and decided that's what I want to do instead of being a vet. So I kind of half-heartedly sent in my vet school applications and applied to National Canine and got in and the rest is history, pretty much. <laughs> so, th- I mean, this is in your blood here since the, you know, almost since coming out of the womb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I used to, I have all the little puppy in my pockets, you know, the little rubber dog toys from back in the 90s. I have, I'm pretty sure, almost all of them, except the one that a squirrel stole when we were camping. And uh, I had all them, and we'd buy the Barbie sets only if they came with dogs, and then the Barbies would go off to the side and, you know, just sit there, and I would play with the little dogs. And my dad was actually a canine handler for the sheriff's office, well, we had the Bloodhound Hooch, so I got to help with some of that training, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I also got to see the other canine handler who had a dual-purpose dog, and that was really exciting. I really liked watching that. Um, and Hooch got hundreds of miles of trails laid by me because I was always raring to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and when I was little, I remember thinking, I want to train animals to be in the movies. But then I realized I had to move to California, and I didn't. When I was seven, that was really scary. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> So you were the guinea pig that your dad would kind of send you out and, and put the trail down for the dogs to practice? Yeah, I was kind of the permanent volunteer. I mean, he never had to ask me to do it. He was, It was, you know, hey, do you want to run a trail for Hooch Day? And I was like, yes, let's run four. So <laughs> no rain, sun, it didn't matter. I was, I'd be out there trucking through the, through the mud and sagebrush and whatever else we could throw at him. So it was a lot of fun, though. I mean, those have to be some pretty fun memories, being a kid and just being like, I get to go out and do whatever I want. I know this dog's going to find me, but I get to go where I want and try to hide and all that, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would try to, I would try my hardest to trick that dog, but he was, he was a trusted <laughs> machine. He was, he was bred for it and he was just a working dog. And, and you it said he was a, he was a bloodhound, you said? 
He was, yeah. He was donated to the sheriff's office by the Ali Morales Foundation when I was in fourth grade. We got him, um, and he was, he ended up being probably, I think, 115 pounds. He was a big dog. Wow. Um, but just a marshmallow. He was just a sweet, sweet dog. Um, but, yeah, so that was really cool just to get to to be involved with that. And I went to a couple of bloodhound and canine handling seminars with my dad. Um, I got to be his plus one. My mom stayed home and <laughs> let me tag along, so that was pretty awesome too. Do you remember so what kind of things? You, do you remember what kind of things you used to do to, you know, to try to hide on him or get away from him? Oh yeah, so we started, of course, with just puppy trails, you know, where you just run and hide, and he comes and finds you right away. And as he progressed, we would, um, you know, we would lay the trail, so we'd kind of mark where it started, and I would, they'd say, okay, we're going to go pick you up on the other side of the old pen, which we have the old historic penitentiary from back in the old west days here. So they have a big chunk of property and it's all sagebrush and stuff. So I'd go run through the, you know, through that little field area and around trees and up and over rocks. And I'd climb up in the tree and out of the tree and just, wow. you know, just run and run and all these different loopy loops. And then we kind of, I kind of pick where I was going to hide when we'd come back and we'd mark that. And then a day or a couple of days later, we'd go back and my mom would drop me off at my hiding spot. And then my dad would go around to the start. So he, he didn't know where I was. At. He didn't know the end of the trail. He had no idea what happened in the middle of the trail. So it was, you know, really a blind trail for him. He knew where I started and he kind of knew where I ended just so, you know, they could pick me up at the end, but he didn't know where I was going to hide. And so I'd sit there and wait and wait and wait and I'd hear Hooch coming and he'd bay and bay and then it'd go quiet a little bit. So I knew he was kind of working and trying to figure out where I was yeah. and you'd hear him bay again. And um, it was pretty cool. I remember the first time I hid in a tree, Hooch wasn't quite sure what to do, but yeah. But after that, he learned to look up when he hit a tree and there was no other sense. So <laughs> that was pretty cool. So how old was the trail technically before, you know, during these some of these times when, uh, he, you know, your dad would put hooch on it to try to find you? I think the oldest one we did was close to a week. Really? Yeah. Holy cow. I think that was the oldest one. Um, a lot of them were, you know, a couple days. Some of them were a couple hours. Some of them were immediate. Um, but I... I remember the oldest one being about a week, somewhere in that range. Wow. And that was really, that was a, that was kind of a, eh, we'll see if he does it or not, but he did it. And he, I mean, he was right on it the entire time at dogs. Those noses are amazing on those bloodhounds. And so how, how long would the trail roughly be, Ashley? I mean, a, you know, a couple hundred yards, quarter of a mile. What do you think ballpark it might've been? Oh, I'd probably say about a half mile to a mile. Wow. Um, was kind of probably the average. We did some shorter ones too, of course, just kind of depending on where we were and where we laid it. But some of our wide open spaces ones were probably close to a mile. Now, obviously, I mean, I'm assuming he's also living with you guys too, right? Yes, Hooch lived with us. So (laughs) how much of that do you think is him, you know, knowing you so well compared to going out and trying to find somebody that got lost two days later on a scent that he didn't know? I mean, have you ever thought about anything like that? Yep, and we set him up for that, too. So my best friend at the time, Andrea, we were little, and um, we did everything together. And so she would come over and, you know, hang out, of course, all the time. And so we go run trails for Hooch, and we would scent Hooch on Andrea's scent and not mine. Ah. And so we would start off the trail together. We'd crisscross paths. You know, we'd go our separate ways. We'd come back, crisscross again, kind of do our own thing, and then we'd split off and hide in totally separate directions. And we would scent Hooch on Andrea because he was so used to finding me. We wanted to make sure that he would find this other not-as-familiar scent. Um, and so he did really good with that. He found a lot of, um, you know, he found some lost people. He found there was a couple of guys that escaped from prison transports and that sort of thing, and he found them as well. Wow. Um, I mean, that dog, he was pretty awesome. Pretty cool dog. Lots of slobber, though. Lots, <laughs> lots and lots of slobber. <laughs> yeah, like kinda... getting tarred and feather in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> it probably comes with a territory, though, right? Yes, yes, it's definitely... Definitely the the downfall of having a bloodhound is you get tarred and feathered in the summer with the slime and the hair. So in the winter the, it's not as bad because it freezes. So yeah, That's good. the first time you go up into a tree and he's searching the scent and you know, I, I'm sure I, it's funny when you say that all I could picture was him like circling the bottom of the tree trying to you know process everything and figure out where are you and what did where did she go and that kind of things because dogs don't naturally look up. Um, unless you see a bird or a plane or something like that, right? So this is way different for him at this time. Yeah, and that's exactly what he did. He circled the tree and he was kind of whining and doing that 
that half bay, a little bit of a boof in there, just kind of really frustrated and confused. And he would just circle, circle, circle. So I took a little stick and broke it, and he stopped and looked around like, I don't know. I went back to work looking, looking, and looking. And then he finally, he was sniffing up and down the base of the tree, and he finally caught my scent going up the tree and looked up, and he just, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So he got his, his beef liver and his loves, and he just was super excited. And after that, whenever he'd come to a tree and the trail would end, he'd look up. Wow. I, see if I was up there. And that was my next question was what kind of a re- reward did you have for him when, you know, he did find you? He worked for fried beef liver. Wow. So we'd go to the store and we'd buy calf liver. It's already in little thin slices. And my dad would fry it. And then we'd cut it up into um, little strips and we'd put them in freezer baggies and freeze them. And when we go run a trail, we'd stick the beef liver in my pocket. And when he got there, he got the snack. <laughs> and so would you give him the snack or was you, was your dad doing it? A um, little bit of both. Usually yeah. I would give it just so that Hooch wasn't distracted by the scent of liver in my dad's pocket in the beginning. Yep. Um, but then on, on real trails, you know, when he actually got called out for that sort of stuff, my dad would give it to him at the end. Gotcha. Um, one of my favorite stories is my dad was, they were looking for an escaped, I think he was an escaped prisoner. I can't remember all the details of that, but they found him and the um, other law enforcement guys ended up catching the guy before Hooch found him, but he was on his trail. So my dad said, well, we got to let the dog finish the trail. Yeah. And so the guy was handcuffed sitting by the rock and, um, you know, leaning up against the rock and hand behind his back. And Hooch just tracked him, goes up to him. And man, at that point, Hooch was just, you know, all hot and lathered up and his <laughs> slime was just going full bore. And he slimed that guy's face, just oh. ran his face over his like, I found you. This is so exciting. <laughs> and that guy couldn't wipe his face. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I laughed a lot. It's oh, definitely a hooch moment. I was like, yeah, that I could definitely see that happening. Hooch the, would totally do that. The humility <laughs> of getting caught, right? You know that somebody, you know, you escape, you get caught, and then you're cuffed, and then and then now it's like icing on the cake. You get that huge like slobber across the face, and then you can't wipe it off. <laughs> yeah, he was not able to wipe it off. I think somebody else got a paper towel or something to wipe it off for him. But man. I was like, oh, that's probably my worst case scenario is being slimed in the mouth by Hooch and not being able to wipe it off. Yeah. Wow. When you have this Yorkie at such a young age, Ashley, I mean, you have to have some sort of working knowledge before you are starting to take best in shows here. So where in the kind of the midst of things at this age are you learning how to handle the dog in the ring and and all the stuff, that the logistics that goes along with that? Well, I joined 4-H. Um, once when we got Bo and I, I think I joined probably when I was about six or seven. So we'd had him for a couple of years, you know, just cause I was so young, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, but I joined 4-H and that's really, you know, that really, I think kind of boosted me along as well, getting, you know, to do the dog class and really be into the dog thing. And, and the teachers there, you know, the leaders were helping and, um, other kids were into it too. So, you know, I did swimming and basketball and all that, but um, you know, 4-H was really what I looked forward to the most out of all of those things. You know, the 4-H night at the fairgrounds, we got to go down there and play with the dogs and work the dogs and, and teach them. And um, Bo was just, I mean, he was just a little ham. He just ate it up and loved to be looked at and pranced around. And he was just a, he was a really good little first dog. So um, that helped having one that was really willing to work and excited about it too. Is your dad just kind of like carrying you along during all this and giving you pointers here and there as you're, you know, kind of growing up and dealing with dogs? I mean, it sounded like you were around dogs 24-7 during your entire childhood. Yeah, and so when we got Onyx, when I was in fifth grade, we got Onyx, and I started her on agility stuff, and I joined 4-H with her too, of course, so I had the two dogs. And then um, I really wanted to teach her to track too with Hooch, you know, because I wanted to do that too. And so we, we worked with Onyx and got her doing some tracking stuff and when we'd go camping, we'd let both dogs go and, you know, I'd go and hide. And having Onyx there with Hooch, you know, it turned it more into a competition. So he really worked extra hard when Onyx was there kind of pushing him along and she was tracking too. So that was really fun. Um, but, yeah, definitely, you know, having that, having him be the canine handler for for the bloodhound and stuff definitely, you know, helped me along with some of that that training aspects and, and just learning different, different things about it all, how it all kind of comes together, you know, going from, from agility and, the confirmation stuff in 4-H to doing tracking and then seeing some of the other police dogs that are at our seminars and the other um, sheriff canine was, you know, definitely all kind of came together and all played a huge part in it. 
And Onyx was your lab uh, Border Collie Blue Healer mix, right? Yes. And so that's a lot of dog for a fifth grader. I mean, if one of my clients walks through the door right now and says, this is the type of dog I have, I'm like, oof, all right, you you know, we've got to kind of buckle down here. I mean, it, <laughs> did you find that with that, with Onyx early on, that this was like, this is a lot more of a dog than, than Bo is? Yeah, she was, well, we had Hooch, so. You know, we had a little, you know, four-pound Yorkie and then a hundred-pound Bloodhound. So she was kind of a happy medium. You know, she was a yeah. little bit more motivated to work and learn and and train and that sort of stuff than Bo was. But you know, she still had that summer strength, but not so bad as Hooch being a hound and and a tracking dog and you know a working dog. So she was kind of in the middle ground there. So I think having those other dogs helped as well. Um, you know, we also had Biscuit. She was another Yorkie, but she was she didn't. I don't think I was her favorite person. <laughs> she was definitely my dad's dog. But um, you know, Onyx, she was she was a challenge. She definitely had, you know, had a lot of a lot of challenges that came with her and you know, I'm sure some of that was me being so young and literally not knowing what I was doing really for the most part. Um, she wasn't a dog person and she wasn't a people person. So, it was really just us, <laughs> my family and and uh, one of my friends, we'd always walk our dogs together. She got a a German Shepherd and Onyx didn't like him at first, and they became buddies. But really, other than that, she did not like other dogs at all. Um, so there's definitely, you know, if I had her now, there's definitely some big things I would do differently with her as far as socializing mm-hmm. and exposure and that sort of thing. And, you know, and really kind of setting some stricter boundaries with her. But, you know, I was young and had my agility dog, so I was happy. <laughs> And so when National Canine comes along, I mean, obviously you've kind of been under your dad's tutelage here for your childhood. You you already are very well versed in tracking and, you know, in the ring, uh, agility stuff. Do you feel like when you start schooling that this is more of a review than it is than, you know, learning something new? Um, some of it, yeah, I was, you know, I was of course excited to go and learn new things, but there was, you know, a lot of it that I kind of, I was already really familiar with. Um, and at that point I had gotten... Um, a golden retriever puppy. I was supposed to get her to raise for a service dog company to do the puppy raising portion through college. Yeah. Um, but that company ended up shutting down in 2010, I think. They ran out of money, and so they just said, hey, if you want to keep the dog, keep it. There's a whole other story to that. Some lady ended up stealing her. It was a disaster, but we got her back. Um, and Sparks, at that point, she had been, you know, she'd go in with me everywhere. She was, you know, her public access training was pretty much done. She was you know, she was great. I had her for a year longer than I was supposed to through the puppy raising just because this company was having so many troubles. Mm. Um, and so at that point, she needed a job. She couldn't just be, you know, in the backyard and just be a normal dog. You know, she needed more after the first two years of her life being with me 24-7 and having a job. So we started search and rescue with her and did tracking and cadaver work with her as well. And she took to that like a fish to water. She loved finding cadaver. It was her favorite thing. Wow. So, um I had her as well, and then my other Border Collie, Riot, that we got from Charlie. He was the best dog ever. So I took Riot with me to school, and, um, you know, we learned a lot, and it really, you know, it refined all of his skills as well, and he learned a lot of new things from there as well. Some of it, you know, I felt like I was pretty confident with, but there were definitely, you know, like the police canine training part and some more of the scent detection stuff and some task training and that sort of thing, of course, were all, all new and good to learn, so... But it was kind of nice having, you know, the background that I did and the experience that I had. So it wasn't all new. It wasn't totally overwhelming going into this, you know, mostly blind. I kind of had a pretty good, pretty good background on a lot of the stuff, which helped a lot. And when you go into National Canine, are you thinking when you come out of it, you're, you know, you're going to do boarding and daycare and training and you and you have this grand idea? Um, Kind of. You know, they they did have a – they've changed their program a bit now, um, so the, I think the kennel management part is a little bit more in-depth, but they did go over that too. Um, you know, I really wanted to get into more training, but being in a small town, I was like, well, I don't know if I can just do training. You know, it's all those pieces kind of start coming together, and you really start thinking, what am I going to do after I get done here? <laughs> you know, college is great, and school is fun, and this is great learning all the dog things, but what's next? Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I had my ideas, you know, and, Um, you know, different, I started designing kennels when I was little. I remember Hmm. having a, I had to be in elementary school. I remember a little drawing and I called it Colson Kennels because I was real original (laughs) in elementary school. So (laughs) I remember drawing that. Yes. (laughs) So that's my super unique name that I should have went with. But, 
I remember doing that, but, you know, once I got done there, I, you know, I kind of really wanted to. Our vet clinic here was boarding at the time, and I was like, well, you know, they have the kennels. I don't know the two would be able to, to run in the same town. You know, we have – our population is 9,000, so it's a pretty little town. Yeah. Um, but just kind of the more it started going and I, the training really took off and um, the vet clinic started talking about not having offering boarding anymore. And so I was like, well, maybe. And I just started really kind of exploring it and decided that's really what I wanted to do. So I graduated National Canine in 2011. Um, after I graduated from the University of Wyoming, I went there. And then in 2016, we opened the training, boarding, and daycare facility that we have now. So. So you're still kind of in the newer phase as far as a facility is concerned, but your experience-wise is that that's what the part that runs deep. Yeah, yeah, we're still we're definitely still new with the boarding and stuff. Um, you know, definitely still learning the holidays and you know trying to get all that sorted out and you know just trying to balance everything out. You know, having a boarding kennel is definitely a twenty-four-seven job, and um, you know, so trying to balance you know, work and personal life and everything else can be a little bit of a challenge. Happily, my dad um, is coming to the rescue again. He has been helping me out, you know, every single day since we opened down here. He comes down and and uh, will help me with the dogs, you know, let them out, watching the daycare dogs and the boarding dogs. And, you know, he'll, when I'm, when we go hunting or we go out of town or something, he'll run, you know, he'll come down and do all the kennel stuff for me. And then, you know, of course, when he wants days off, you know, whatever, take all the days off you need. But, <laughs> um so it's really been nice to have him helping as well. That's kind of helped help kind of balance things out for sure. I've had a number of uh, national canine trainers on here, you know, ones that have graduated from there. And I don't know if I've actually asked this, but do they talk a lot about socializing and how to socialize dogs at that, at, you know, when you go through the program? As far as like in a boarding setting? Yeah, like a daycare type of situation. Uh-huh. You know, I feel like they probably did, but that doesn't – I can check my notes. Um, I'm trying to think. I know we went over a lot of body language stuff and um, that sort of thing. We did, you know, of course, the puppy socializing, that was big, obedience, yep. um, scent work, that sort of thing. But I don't remember specifically um, – I know we went over some body language stuff just, you know – to be able to identify stuff, but I don't know. Now that you mentioned that, I don't know that I specifically recall that. And they may have, and I may have just, you know, glossed it over and kind of put it in the back of my mind. Yeah. But, so when you um, when you yeah. open up your facility, is that kind of a crash course for you in daycare? Um, a little bit. Yeah. You know, I'd been doing a lot of research, you know, in the years leading up to it, of course, you know, and then with the training, you know, we had most of our dogs are just, you know, your typical rowdy dog that needs some manners and yep. a little bit of guidance. But I did have some that had some, you know, some reactivity issues and some, some socialization issues. So some of that kind of helped, but it was more of a one-on-one -on -one setting. So it was a little bit more controlled. Um, but, you know, there's so much information on the internet now that a lot of that research was pretty easy to come by. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's just been kind of observing and, and, you know, learning from that. And then in college, you know, I had dogs, my roommate had dogs, our friend has dogs, all of our other friends had dogs, so we always got together. We didn't go to the dog park, but we'd go to a park yep. and let the dogs play and to the river and stuff. So we got to see a lot of that interaction as well. And then um, I feel like just, yeah, just a lot of kind of independent research sort of helped sort that out. And so you've dabbled in a lot of different areas here, and now you have your facility open. Do you have like, I mean, what's, what are you more passionate about and all the things that you've, you know, experienced with, with dogs and in, in different trainings? Um, I really enjoy sin detection. I just think it's fascinating how their nose works and how they can, you know, sort through everything that's going on and find that one little bit of scent. Um, of course, agility. I still love agility. I've, I kind of got out of it when Riot started getting sick and, um, so I kind of backed out of that a little bit, but I got another little dog now. So we did a competition last year. Um, her first one, she did pretty good. Nice. So, you know, still definitely into agility, um, you know, a lot of the scent work stuff. But I think those are probably two of my two of my favorite things. And then, of course, the trick training is super fun, um, especially now that I have a little dog that's, you know, she can do all kinds of fun things as a smaller dog, launching off trees and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. 
So I was I was doing my homework, and of course, I, you know, I'm going through your website, and I come across something that we do not have to worry uh, one incy teensy little thing about, and that's rattlesnakes, because <laughs> yes. we don't have any of those things up here. Uh, <laughs> when in your training does this come about? You teach a rattlesnake avoidance class, I'm assuming, or lessons, something along those lines. So how does that come about for you, and how does that even work? So. Back to Hooch, at the first seminar I went to up in Sheridan, Wyoming, um, they did a snake avoidance, just kind of a little lesson for the dogs because when those bloodhounds are tracking, I always say hounds can either use their nose or their brain at the same time. I don't think they can both function together. <laughs> so <laughs> when the nose is on, that's what's, that's what's going. So when those dogs are tracking, you know, they're just going. They'll go out in the middle of the interstate and just keep rolling. Wow. Um, you know, they just they're just so focused. So the trainers up there really wanted to make sure that being in Wyoming, these tracking dogs, you know, a lot of times their trails are out in the country, they're out in the sagebrush, out in rattlesnake territory. And so they wanted to make sure that those dogs were aware of what's going on because they'll just plow through anything, at least Hooch would. Um, also, he was so big that he could. So I, I don't remember all of the details about it. I remember they had a snake and they had the e-collar. And I remember Hooch went up to it, you know, just normal, hey, what's this funny thing? And I remember they corrected him with the e-collar, and then he never went back to the snake ever again. Wow. Um, I don't remember if what they had as far as safety-wise with the snake. I'm sure they did something, but I was fourth or fifth grade, so there was not, you know, I don't remember all of the little details about it. That's where it kind of started. And so the year, so right after I graduated college in spring of 2011, I started National Canine that fall. So that summer, I decided I wanted to try that with our dogs. So we caught a snake. We muzzled it. Um, wait, so wait, 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 <laughs> Ashley, wait, what do you mean you just caught a snake? Like you can't just breeze over that and be like, we just caught a rattlesnake. I mean, how does oh, that happen? Well, well, it's just so normal around here. I forget that that's not normal for <laughs> Yeah, <everybody>. you think? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we're, you know, we're in high desert area. So there are snakes everywhere, especially in the summer, it gets hot. They start cruising around and really the snakes just kind of wander into town. They're just out doing their own little snake thing and they wander into town and oh they have cool grass to lay in they have nice basking spots you know new scenery to check out so these snakes are just cruising around town just checking stuff out and there's it's not like an infestation of snakes it's like you know they'll peter in one or two will come in and they're in different spots of town and stuff you know just because literally all around us is just prairie so they'll just kind of wander in and i don't remember exactly how we came about the snake if we went out and looked for it or if we caught it in town um, but we ended up with this snake, we muzzled him and then we put the, I borrowed an e-collar cause I didn't have one at the time. So I borrowed an e-collar and I don't think it worked super consistently. Oh boy. So that was neat. Yeah. So took the dogs through, um, Charlie, the border collie got it the first time. Riot was the best. He jumped about three feet up and three feet back. It spooked him so much when I corrected him with the e-collar because this new funny thing that he was already a little bit unsure of zinged him and he was like whoa what is that and he i mean he for the next nine years he never went near a snake he would stay way away from him um onyx she got it the first day we did her we checked him again the second day and she was going in for the kill wow Um, i'm pretty sure she might have also been part black bear (laughs) she saw that (laughs) thing she's like it's on so but then after that time she decided it wasn't worth it so that was good and then my dad's little beagle um, at that point, you know, we had lost Hooch a few years back. So we ended up, he ended up with this little miniature beagle and, uh, she was, we got her with the e-collar, corrected her with the e-collar and she jumped back, shook herself, hackles went up and she, wow, sorry, my cat just knocked everything over. Um, I don't know if you can hear that crashing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but she jumped back and she shook herself off her hackles went up and she went back in for it. So we corrected her again. And even to this day, she's, oh gosh, she's, 12 11 now and she only weighs like 17 pounds you could not drag that dog up to a snake she will lock in and just dig into the ground and she will not so that's good wow um and then when i got back from national canine and decided i wanted to offer that class to the public as well you know i had more knowledge about e-collars and how they all worked and how the training worked and um you know i was a little bit more confident as a trainer after going to school and and so i started offering it for the public and it's just kind of taken off since then and at this point, if we um, every summer I you know post multiple times on different Facebook groups in town to you know if you see a snake, 
call me. We'll come get it. If you know, if you call me after hours or I don't answer for whatever reason, they'll call the police department. The police department will get a hold of me um, through different phone numbers or my dad, who will also go out and get catch snakes. So we'll go pick them up, and if they're big enough, we'll use them. If not, we take them back out of town and let them go again. So they can continue on their snake missions, whatever it is they do out there. Is the e-collar the only way that you have used to do the the rattlesnake avoidance? Yes. Um, I know there's other people use different techniques, but it's the one that we found that works the most effectively. Um, you know, and it's it's a little bit more efficient as well. You know, I've heard of trainers that use dead snakes, which is okay, but of course, dead things smell differently than live things, and it's not you don't get the movement and the sound of the rattle and the yeah. Um, you know, that interaction that we want the dogs to have. So we try to keep the dog's interaction with the snake as natural as possible. So we, we have it set up in kind of a little four station course and we take the dogs through one at a time. Uh, my dad is my snake wrangler. So he has the snake tongs and he makes sure the snakes are where they're supposed to be and they're not cruising off somewhere. Um, and I'll walk the dogs through. And so I just tell the owner just to walk like you don't see the snake and keep the leash loose. We don't want any outside, um, influences is the word I want from the owner. We don't want them to tell them no or give them a leash correction or anything like that. You know, we don't want any pressure pulling back on the leash. We want that dog to go right up to that snake and check it out. Um, and then at that point when he gets, you know, the dog gets within, because snakes can strike the whole length of their body. Wow. So if you have a two-foot snake, if the dog's within that two-foot bubble, um, that's kind of when I correct him with the e-collar if they're focused on the snake. And so they start to learn that that snake is not a thing they want to mess with. But we also keep the owner kind of on the sidelines as far as the dog's concerned. So that if you have your dogs out, you know, if you take them out to run in the country, because like I said, there's so much open space here. You can just take your dogs outside of town and let them run and play and do their thing and not really have to worry about coming across any other people. Um, Or being in town, you know, like I said, the snakes come into town all the time. So, you know, you might have one show up in your backyard. And if you're not there, dogs are smart. If they think, okay, I'm going to get corrected for this. My owners are around. Mom and dad aren't out here. I'm going to go check this thing out just to really see what it is. Yeah. You know, and we definitely don't want that. You know, rattlesnake bites can definitely be, can be deadly. I was just going to say, how how long does a dog have after a bite before, you know, you're, that dog is in trouble? So it really depends on the snake and the situation and what time of year it is. So mature rattlesnakes can kind of ration out how much venom they produce, how much they give out in a bite. So oh. sometimes you can get bit by a snake and it's a totally dry bite. Oh. No venom, you know, or minimal venom. There might be some in there. but And then other times, you know, so like the really young ones don't really have any control over it. Um, if it's early spring when they're just coming out of hibernation, you know, of course, all that venom's kind of kind of ready to go in there. Their, their reserves are full. So those bites at that time can typically be a little bit more dangerous. Um, but every bite should be treated as a life-threatening emergency, you know, and taken to the vet immediately, which, like I said, being around here, there's a lot of open spaces. We take our dogs, you know, we have a reservoir that's an hour outside of town. So if my dog gets bit at the lake, it's at least an hour in to get them to the vet. So our vet clinics offer the rattlesnake vaccine, which I don't know if your guys' vets out there do, but not that I'm aware they of. have that. And so how that works is, if your dog gets a bet, you still need to get them in immediately, you know, load them up, leave your tent, whatever, get them to town. But what that does is it kind of helps your dog build up a little bit of antibodies against the venom with that vaccine. And so it buys you a little bit more time to get into the vet clinic. And it also helps speed up the recovery uh, time as well. So instead of spending, you know, a week at the vet clinic, your dog might spend three days. And it of course varies dog to dog and bite to bite, but, um, Basically, it buys you more time, and it helps speed up recovery. Is that something that's administered when the dog gets bit? No. Or so it's, it's preventative? Administered, um, it's a preventative vaccine. Gotcha. So they do the first one. So if it's your dog's very first time getting the vaccine, they'll do it. So say they do it March 1st. April 1st, you'll need a booster for it. Yep. And then after that, it's every year. Wow. Um, and I'm not sure about in places like Arizona, where it never really gets super cold, or southern Texas, where it's you know, nice all the time and the snakes are always out. But up here, our winters are so cold that there's no snakes for half the year. So I don't know if you'd have to do it more being in a in a warmer climate, but um, I do all of ours in March. That way, if we have a warm spring, it's already on board and they're ready to go just in case that happens. 
Um, so the snake training, of course, is not 100%. You know, nothing is. If right. your dog's tearing across the field and steps on a snake, it's going to jump up and, you know, probably bite your dog in the leg. Yeah. You know, or if you throw your ball and your dog goes to pick it up and not really paying attention to its surroundings, you know, the snake can be in the sagebrush and come out and bite it. Um, but, you know, the idea is if your dog is just kind of moseying along, going for a walk through town or it's out in your backyard, if they see that snake, they're going to know to stay away from it. And so we kind of try to teach them the sight, the sound, and the smell of the animal of that snake, just so they can identify it through all different things. We've had some dogs that, after going through the class, the sprinklers become scary because it makes that sound. Oh, no kidding! Like the rattlesnake. Yeah, so we've had some dogs that are a little bit suspicious of sprinklers. Um, <laughs> could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, I feel like that's probably a fair trade-off. At least they know. And then we had one one big big beefy German shepherd come through, you know, just a big block headed, really big muscular dog. And there was a garter snake <laughs> in their backyard on the sidewalk, totally harmless garter snake. And that dog would not leave the porch. Wow. He just stood up there and was like, Nope, I'm not going out there to go potty. Yeah. So, you know, I've had quite a few people tell me, Hey, you know, we came across a snake and my dog stayed away from it, which is great. And up until last summer, my dogs had never encountered a snake outside of the class. We were lucky, I guess, because we go out to the lake all the time. We're out in the country doing four-wheeler rides and stuff all the time. So um, last summer, I got a got a new puppy in May, and end of June, I got up early, put all the dogs out in the backyard like I do every day, and I was kind of cleaning the house and doing laundry, and I decided I was going to get a pup out of the garage a couple hours later. You know, I'd look out the window at them, and they're playing and doing their thing. So I stepped off the deck, and I came out the door, and all four dogs, you know, were up there wagging around and super excited, and... I stepped off the deck and they all just kind of stopped and stared at me like, you're going to get bit. It's your turn finally. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what is your guys' problem? And so I kept walking and I finally heard it and I stopped and there's a little, a little brick red colored rattlesnake about three feet from me just coiled up glaring at me. And I was like, oh, good. Wow. Everybody needs to go inside. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, luckily I was, I had done my puppy a little bit earlier than I do and I like to do puppies when I take them through. I usually like him to be at least four months old. We did pistol when he was about three months. And I'm really glad I did because that snake was in our backyard. And, um, yeah, I think that he probably would have got bit because he went right up to the snake the first time I took him through the class. So definitely was a a little bit of a scary moment, but also kind of a, hey, it really worked. Yep. Yay. Proud moment, <laughs> too. Moment. Yeah, because, I mean, we never encountered a snake outside of the class. You know, it's always been. You know, the snakes are muzzled, and, of course, we test them. We put the snakes behind the house where we take them out to run and stuff, but never in a real-life situation like that. So that was good. You know, you've done so many different things with, with dogs, Ashley, and then obviously now you're working with clients' dogs and, you know, behavioral problems and that type of uh, that type of stuff. Knowing what you know about all these different, uh, you know, activities that you can do, you know, with your dog – what is your how would you how would you define to one of your clients you know how to fulfill their dog what do you what is it that they would have to do on a daily basis to make sure their dogs are being fulfilled i try to really you know stress the importance of of getting that mental that mental workout for the dog so you know whether it's you know if they're working we have a lot of shift work with the refinery and you know the pen and of course you know just different people that work different shift work so there's dogs that are alone for you know 10 12 hours at a time during the day um, so, you know, just kind of giving them ideas for some of that mental stimulation they can do while the dog's at home. So, you know, food balls, puzzle toys, um, you know, things like that. Getting, a, you know, a, a specific digging area in the yard. Just trying to help address, you know, whatever issues it is they may be having and kind of turning it into more of a productive, if we can, you know, it's so like the digging, you know, give them that mental challenge. But also, you know, if it's something they really like to do, you know, set up a little sandbox, bury some toys, let them kind of go to town with that. And just really that mental stimulation is really what I try to stress the most with them. So, you know, the obedience training and going for structured walks and, and testing their dogs in new places, you know, going to, we have a couple pet friendly stores here. So, you know, going to one of the feed stores, you know, when it's really busy and having your dog place somewhere and, and just having them hang out while people walk through the doors and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, that's really the mental, the mental stimulation is really what I try to try to drive home with them. Um, just because a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the typical behavioral problems is just from boredom and lack of rules is, you know, what I see a lot of 
you know, and I'm sure a lot of trainers do as well, you know, just your typical rowdy, out of control, naughty dog. Yep. Um, you know, they just don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And so they come up with their own ideas on what it is. <laughs> that they do. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, you know, it's not, you know, it's not like, hey, I'm bored. I'm going to clean the kitchen at 3 a.m. It's, you know, <laughs> hey, I'm bored. I'm going to peel the wallpaper off and maybe chew up the carpet. So, <laughs> you know, they don't really always have the most productive ideas of how to break their boredom. But, you know, I try to, I try to get owners to, to kind of think of activities that their dog can do to really help them think. So instead of feeding them out of a bowl, you know, get a puzzle toy and put their food in that and let them wrestle with that around while you go to work in the morning. Um, you know, just little things like that that can kind of help help give their dog that mental challenge until they can get home and really do something with them. What do you um, think you is know, one of, of the biggest mistakes? Your dog. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes that uh, dog owners make today? I think it's giving your dog too much freedom too soon. It's yeah. really one of them. Huh. You know, you know, you have your your puppy and he's four months old and he's doing great and he's so well behaved and you you leave him out when you go to work and you come home and now your couch is destroyed. You know, it's people I think you're just giving their dogs too much freedom too soon. You know, they have that idea of I want to get a dog and be able to leave him out in the house when I'm gone for the day. And they don't realize that that can take literally years to get to that point. You know, it's not just get this puppy and work with him for a couple months and then be like, all right, he's good. Yeah. You know, he's still a puppy and he's still, you know, definitely going to have some issues there. It always slays me when it, when I hear that, and I think that also boils down to the whole crate thing, too, that people just want to get rid of the crate. We have to get rid of the crate. Uh, we haven't had an accident in the house in two weeks. The dog's good. Let's get rid of it. Let's fold it up, put it in the attic, put it in the basement. Let's start, you know, testing the dog with its freedom. And, yeah, it's four months old. And and it just is like, oh, there's so much that can go wrong with that, you know, especially because people are gone. I mean, it sounds like they're, you know, you said people have longer shifts there. Um, and, and that's just, it is setting the dog up to fail. And then, you know, to get them back takes a lot more work than it did initially because everything's new again. And so I, absolutely, to me, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's too much freedom too soon. There's too many liberties that we give our dogs. And I, I think that just gets a lot of people into a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know, and that the people, the dislike for the crate, you know, and I, people see it as punishment and, you know, I don't want to put them in a jail cell and that's, they just don't understand that dogs, you know, dogs can learn to love their crates. You know, my golden retriever, when I got her, the people that had her before, I don't have proof, but I'm pretty sure she was abused. She was starved and she took one look at the crate. I was kind of walking her through the house on leash and we had a mud room and we had her crate back there. Cause you know, I don't know this dog. I'll put her out here that way. You know, if she has an accident, you know, if she has the stress poops, it's tile. We can just clean it up. Yeah. It's fine. Um, you know, we'll put her in the crate when we go to class and stuff. And she took one look at that crate and just started peeing and backing up and just freaked out. Wow. And, you know, it took it took a lot of work, but she, she got to the point where we'd take her out to play ball and she'd, she'd get tired. She'd grab her ball and she'd go load up in her crate and sit there and be like, all right, let's go home. Yeah. You know, and when she'd get tired, she'd go to her crate. So, you know, it's it's their own personal space. It's like having your own bedroom and people just don't, they don't associate it that way. So I think trying, I try really hard to change people's minds on the crates. Um, you know, it's like having your own room. You can just go to it, your private space, and just kind of decompress. You know, your own space, it's yours. You know, their crate smells like them. Their bed is made the way they want it. You know, they got it nested just how they want it. They have, you know, maybe a special chewy bone in there they can chew on. Um, you know, it's just their own private space to kind of go and decompress and relax and and kind of get away from from life for a little bit. And, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily a punishment. You don't want to use the crate as punishment, but... Right. You know, you definitely want to use it to to prevent any bad habits. I I remember early on, I you know, I always wanted people to use a plastic crate because it was more den-like for the dog. It was more covered, mm -hmm. you know. It seemed to be for a while that you know, the some of my clients were, you know, they were crating with the the wire crates and they put covers over it and that you know, the blankets are being pulled in and the dog's going ballistic <laughs> and uh and then it was like, okay, well, let's talk about what's going on with that, you know. And then I thought makes a lot of sense to go actually with a wire crate because in the heat of the summer, it's not going to be as hot in there. So, you know, I certainly, now I'm on the, the wire crate kick here for who knows how long, but I, you know, I, I think it just, it's unfortunate because it, it represents so much of a jail cell, I think, to a lot of people that it, yeah. it gives it this bad association when you, you hit it again on the head. Uh, it is their bedroom. It is their own space to be in and be comfortable and have that alone time. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's, you know, many more. There's so many, you know, on Etsy and probably Amazon, you know, there's so many really cool, um, you know, really nicely designed crates that don't even look like a crate. You know, they're yeah. decorative. They have, you know, little storage things in them and they're, um, you know, of course, they're super expensive because they're so well made and they're so pretty. But, <laughs> you know, and we built our dogs their own crates um, just out of pallets and, and wood, you know, because they're all at that point where they're not going to eat it. So that's good. But, you know, we built them, you know, to be tall enough to use, you know, as like side tables next to the bed and they're roomy enough that they can have the big soft bed, you know, and really kind of spread out and sprawl out in there. Um, so, I mean, you know, a crate can be whatever you want. You can get the wire crates and, you know, kind of disguise it, make it look like a more decorative end table. And uh, my parents just got another New Yorkie. They got her from a shelter down in Denver. Um, and they just, you know, they bought a little end table crate for her. And so they use it by their couch and that's her little crate and she loves it. And it looks nice. And so, I mean, they don't have to be, you know, this, this ugly, gigantic no. jail cell in your living room, you know, um, but yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, of course, the wire look gives it that old timey, you know, big nose George yes. prison cell look. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, kind of definitely changing that perception and that that idea of crates are bad is, you know, something that I really try to work for with, especially new puppy owners, you know, while everything is still fresh and new and, and people that go to the shelter and adopt a dog, you know, create it, expect the worst till you know what's going to happen because you don't know this dog. Yeah. You know, you don't know what this dog's been doing at its previous home or homes for, you know, however long and, and what bad habits it has. Is it going to eat your drywall? Is it going to chew on the cords? Is it, you know, it's, you know, the destruction, but also the safety of not having your dog crated. You know, is your dog going to chew a cord and, you know, shock itself yeah. or get tangled up in something? You know, you just never know. You know, oftentimes I find myself, uh, you know, I'll... I kind of get on a kick of a focus of something that I'm doing with my clients or with the dogs or something, and it might be something to do with leash work or something to do with going for a walk or, you know, something along those lines. Do you ever find yourself kind of focusing on one subject or one <laughs> exercise for a couple of weeks at a time? Yes, I do. And when I catch myself, I try to, I try to kind of ease more things into my my routine at that point and you know what I'm telling people but yeah definitely you know there's some things where I'm like oh this is really good everybody should do this yes and that just kind of becomes <laughs> we should all do the same thing together um, <laughs> kumbaya and then you know a couple of weeks later it's we should all do this let's all create chain our dogs let's all do puzzle toys um, you know let's all have really structured walks and work on the place you know it's yeah, definitely kind of going through. And I think it depends on, you know, what dogs I have for training at that point or what even my own dogs are going through at that time where I'm like, my God, why are you digging up the grass? So then we go back to the puzzle toys where we go back to, you know. And so kind of, I think, you know, what I'm going through, you know, at that stage with, you know, either client dogs or my own dogs kind of helps feed into that as well. So, you know, kind of applying, hey, I'm struggling with this. Is there anybody else having this problem or is it just me? And so, um you know, or, hey, this dog's having an issue with this, so let's try this with everybody for a week at a time. <laughs> um, but I think definitely that plays a that plays a part in it, too, is, you know, what's happening in my life with the dogs that I have at yeah. that time as well. I, I think if you ask my staff, I'm probably the same way where it's like, uh, okay, this is what we're doing now. And, you know, a couple of weeks <laughs> goes by and you're like, okay, this is what we're doing. We're not going to do that. We're still going to do that, but we're going to do this, too. And uh, it, it all kind of be becomes this tongue in cheek, like yeah, Ian's doing his thing again, you know. And uh, I mean, it's it's all in good fun and good humor, and we all just kind of roll along with it. But I, it's certainly, I think I probably do it more in the social group than I do with the one on one stuff, just because yeah. there's, you know, I may have seen something that I hadn't seen before, and you're like, wait, what just happened? And of course, we have you know, cameras all around. So I, I think they're wonderful teachable moments where you can just pull your camera up, look at an interaction that just happened, rewind it 10 or 15 seconds and look at everything leading up to it, you know, and it, it gives you so much information, but then it's, then it becomes this thing. Now it's like, now we're looking for what just happened. And, uh, and it, and it's, and you know, it keeps, it keeps the excitement in the group a little bit as far as <laughs> staff goes, but it, uh, it, it certainly it has its time and place when we when we get on our kicks on our soapboxes. Yes. <laughs> so, what is your definition now that you've done all this stuff, and obviously, your you know your dad's helped you through everything? What is your definition, Ashley, of a dog trainer? 
Oh, geez. I feel like it's just such a, there's just so many different yeah. <laughs> ways to define it. You know, really, you know, of course, you know, the dog training part is kind of obvious with yep. the whole title of dog trainer, but, you know, just really kind of helping, helping dogs, you know, learn how to, how to maneuver in our world is a big part of it. And then also, you know, helping their owners as well. You know, it's more, it's more people training than dog training. Yep. Really, you know, the dogs are the easy part. So, you know, being a dog trainer, you also have to be a people trainer. Um, you know, so you have to know how to really, you know, connect with the person and really kind of help them make sense of it and connect the dots on their own and that sort of thing too. So put it in terms where they understand it, you know, just because us as trainers, you know, I know what I'm talking about when I say it, but sometimes, you know, people don't always understand the same words that we're using. So trying to, trying to really communicate with them and then teaching them how to communicate with their dog, you know, it all, it's, there's just so many different parts of it that have so many different definitions. But I think the biggest thing is just, you know, helping dogs and people live their best lives, you know, just through whatever means you can, you know, whatever means you need to get them to that point. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, we have to be good with people. I, that's, that's number one. If you're not good with people, I don't think you're going to go too far in this type of business. And, you know, as much as we all see those things on Facebook of, you know, I just, I enjoy being around dogs, but not people. <laughs> uh, and, and when I see a dog trainer post that, I just shake my head. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. That's not, that's not the way this works, you know? Um, so it, it's funny. That's a, that's a very difficult question for dog trainers to answer. I, I, and honestly, I don't know if somebody flipped the script on me and said, what do you think it is? I haven't really given it a lot of thought, but it, because there are so many different avenues for us to practice in, I think that's really the biggest yeah. the biggest part of this is, you know, the definition of a trainer for somebody for agility is going to be different than for tracking and probably different for uh, ring work and protection work and all that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's just so many different so many different aspects of the training part of it, but I think the biggest thing is just you know the people. You know, you can train the dog all day, but if the people don't understand what you're doing or don't understand what they're supposed to be doing, it's not going to make a difference once that dog goes home with them. Right. Um, well, Ashley, this has yeah, been uh, this has been fun chatting with you. I'm I'm glad we finally were able to uh, connect here, and uh, yeah. I ho- hopefully you enjoyed yourself. Yes, definitely. All right, so we're going to end this uh, show with what I call the breed game. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to give you a breed, and I want you to give me the first thing that comes to your mind. Oh, boy. Okay. okay. There's only five of them. Ready? Yep. Border Collie. Oh, that's a tough one. I've had so many. Um, God dang. I'm just going to say Riot because that was mine. Okay. <laughs> that's my breed. <laughs> <laughs> Australian Shepherd. Um, we have two of those as well. This is tough. I'll say Bella. I know some Bellas. Beagle. <laughs> oh, Beagle. I'm going to say Buster. Yorkie. Ooh. Let's go with Mo. And Bloodhound. <laughs> How dare you use all my dogs? <laughs> That's the um... idea. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> you see how I did that? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. I want to say Hooch because that was our bloodhound. Gosh. I also know a diesel. Man, I don't know. That's tough knowing, you know, my own personal dogs. Right. With those breeds. Yeah, bloodhounds are tough. You don't see a lot of those, at least around here. I think I've had one come through. No, two. Two come through. I, I've been doing this for almost 13 years. I've only seen two, two come through my daycare. We don't, we don't get a oh, lot man. of them here. Yeah, we've I did training with one and then we had one that came for boarding a while back. I think that's it. I think just the two. I you know what, now that I think about it, I've got one last question for you. You have a you have border collies now? Um, I don't. My little mixed breed is half. My parents have two though. So we're definitely still in the border collie world. <laughs> have you have you ever had any of your border collies in the social group in a daycare setting? Yes. And how did that go for you? Well, so Riot and Charlie, my my other two that we've lost, um, they just really wanted to play with the ball, yeah, the toy. That was their focus. Um, the other dogs they didn't really care about, 
Riot was never really a people person or a dog person. Um, he tolerated them and stuff, but he wasn't really one to get in there and play. So he just kind of, he'd sniff them and then just walk away. Um, my dad's border collie, he likes to play. With other, um, he with gets other a little dogs. nippy. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He'll, he'll run and try to like nip at them a little bit to get them to chase him. Um, and then Harlow, my mom's border collie, she just really wants to play, play ball. She'll carry the ball around. Even I, if nobody else is playing ball, she has her ball and she runs around with it. <laughs> I've had a, a, the reason I asked, I've had a few of them come through my daycare and, and none of them ever looked 100% comfortable. You know, I, I don't know if it's the herding mentality. They're like, all I can see is a hornet's nest and everybody's going in a different direction and this doesn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> this is really stressing me out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't imagine that's that, that you know, it, it certainly was probably stressful on them, but I, I've always kind of wondered that. And then, of course, we just you just said that I, I, I always I'm kind of curious as to other trainers experience with border collies, because I think it can. It goes completely against their DNA. Yeah. Yeah, the ones, you know, the ones that come for boarding and stuff, they they tend to either, if they have another dog in the family, they really tend to either stick to that dog. You know, they'll play with yep. that dog, they'll kind of get in that dog, or they'll really focus on toys. Um, but as far as being like social butterflies, I don't think I've really had any border collies that are really into playing with other dogs. Yeah. That's just, you know, they haven't, I haven't really seen any that are just like, yay, dogs are the best. Yeah. You know, of course, they'll, most of them will tolerate them, you know, and they'll be fine with, you know, running around and sniffing things and that sort of thing. But yeah, I've never, never really seen the collies really get into, to dog on dog playtime. It's more either we're playing fetch or we're sticking to our housemate or I'm just going to come sit by you because this is stressing me out kind of a thing. Yes. <laughs> yep. They need a reprieve and a, and a break. Yeah. Either something to really hyper focus on like Harlow and Riot and Charlie Wood with their toys, or I think they just kind of excuse themselves from the chaos and just kind of watch, yeah. do their own thing. For those Except of you... For lucky. He's kind of an oddball. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that would uh, maybe like to reach out to Ashley, or if you're in the uh, Rollins, Wyoming area, uh, you can look her up. It's oneofakindcanine.com. Uh, she's dabbled in a little bit of everything. So I think you're, uh, if you have a problem, I think she can probably help you out with it. So Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Vermont Dog Trainer Show. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review, subscribe, and share it with your dog friends. For up-to-date information, visit Vermont Dog Trainer Show on Facebook. Until next time. Shut up and train the dogs, man. 